Well, let's take the next step. Uh, we got to the capital asset pricing model with the assumption, the realistic assumption, gamma's not really one, the realistic assumption is that, let's suppose the world is IID, but the world isn't IID. We know that returns are forecastable all the time, uh, forecastable. In the first day, we looked at evidence that returns can be forecast with dividend price ratios. So what happens then? Well, the ICAPM is, is a step trying to keep the flavor of the CAPM, but to incorporate this observation as well. We'll do this in continuous time. So, for example, suppose that the returns can be forecast with X. That means that they might follow a process like this, where X, uh, where X is higher, that means the expected return is higher. X is now a state variable for investment opportunities. That's a but code word you'll hear, and this is exactly what it means. When X is higher, expected returns are higher. How does that affect our, our asset pricing model? Well, intuitively, uh, if you get news that you live in a world with better investment opportunities, that's good news for you. Even given your current wealth, uh, better investment opportunities, that's good news. That means you'll be rich in the future. You might as well go out to dinner tonight and enjoy yourself. That means margin utility will fall. So news ought to affect marginal utility. News ought to be an additional factor. Let's do some math and see how that works. So uh, the, the way to approach this is to define it. Here's another concept you'll see. V is the value function. V is defined as how happy the achieved level of happiness. So the investor is trying to maximize expected utility. And his constraints are, you know, he only has a certain amount of wealth to start with, and he lives in a world where today x, the state variable of investment opportunities, is given. He does the best he can, and then v is the value function, the, the realized level of happiness. Next, there is an envelope theorem that says the derivative of v with respect to wealth is the same as the derivative of utility with respect to consumption. Uh, that's a very intuitive theorem. It says the value of a dollar saved is the same as the value of a dollar consumed. If you're at an optimum and a dollar floats in, how much happier do you feel if you save that dollar for tomorrow or if you go out and, and eat that dollar right away? If you're doing a good job of optimizing, those two things should be exactly equal. If they weren't equal, you should have taken a dollar out of savings and eaten today or vice versa already. Now, that's very useful for us. Look right there. It's going to be the key that lets us substitute out, get rid of margin utilities of consumption in terms of W and X, which is our goal. Our goal is don't use consumption, use determinants of consumption, use something that a theory tells us ought to be linked to consumption instead. So how are we going to do that? We're going to do that with our friend Ito's lemma as usual. So. What does this say? It says that the marginal value of, uh, of wealth equals the marginal utility of consumption. Take our usual, and that's the same as the discount factor. Take our usual Ito's lemma, and what do you get? You get the derivative of the value of wealth with respect to wealth times the change in wealth, the derivative with respect to the state variable x times the change in x, plus some more Ito terms. Uh, you should never leave out the ETO terms, but in this case, we know they're all going to end up being DT terms, and we're only interested in the DZ type terms. Because we're about to plug this into the risk premium, all these ETO terms will end up in RF, which we're not interested in. We're going to just plug those in there, so that's why I don't need to worry about them. So now we plug that discount factor into our basic asset pricing relationship. And, and what do we get? We get that expected excess returns equals the first term, this VWW term times the covariance of returns with the gro growth in wealth. And we get a second term, the VWX term times the covariance of return with the change in the state variable. Or now writing out the same thing in, in discrete time notation, the same VWW term times the covariance of return with the return on wealth. And the VWX term times the covariance of return with this X guy, or if in fact shocks to the X guy, which is what DX is. So what do we got? We got a two-factor model right away. That covariance is going to lead to a beta with respect to the market. That covariance is a beta with respect to X. A two-factor model has emerged. The two factors are return on wealth, no surprise, but now shocks to news. Uh, and, and you know, five. 
with more variables, you're, you're heading to something like Femme and French, which is one of the places we were heading. Now let's look a little bit more carefully at, at these coefficients. This guy here, VWW times WVW, you've seen that before. That's the same expression that deri as derivatives of the utility function that gave us gamma. This is risk aversion. In fact, this is the correct definition of risk aversion. Risk aversion really is the curvature of the value function because we measure risk aversion by asking people how would they react to betting a dollar. They, we react, your reaction to bets on wealth. That's in fact the correct definition of risk aversion. If, if the value function has this power form, it's our friend gamma again, but that quantity is risk aversion. What's this quantity here? What drives the, the pricing effects of betas or covariances on x? Well, VWx over VW, that tells us if x changes, what's the effect on marginal utility? So if you get a big shock to this news, how much does that make you hungrier? Well, that's a natural aversion to the change in the state variable, just as this is the aversion to changes in wealth. Now, it's a property of the value function, not the utility function. There's nothing in preferences that tells you how you feel about news and future opportunities. It's a property of the value function, which is a result of the entire environment, uh, the investment opportunities themselves, as, as well as utility. But you can think of it as sort of a utility function. How unhappy are you made by news that stock returns over the next 10 years are going to be good or bad? If you know you're not going to live for more than a year, it doesn't really care that much. If you know you're going to live longer, for example, that thing would be a bigger number. So assumptions, what have we done? We've taken the standard CAPM der derivation. We've gotten rid of the IID thing. We've incorporated news. Our investor still doesn't have a job. Maybe we should do that next.